computer. Good morning, campers. Um, we are recording. I felt a little bit remiss yesterday, and we just really jumped into Milton's poetry without really talking about Milton's life. And one really can't talk about Milton's poetry without talking about his life in his historical context. Meaning as much as Milton's voice is so individual, it really is very much in interaction with what's happening during his lifetime. Now we see from this timeline, um, that Milton was born in 1608 and died in 1674. We'll move back and forth between this timeline and this timeline. You know, this is just stuff I found on the internet, obviously. Um, so Milton is born in 1608. A, key, a, a very important date is the death of Shakespeare in 1616. So he's eight when Shakespeare dies. He attends St. Paul's School, which is kind of cool because uh, John Donne is the dean of St. Paul's at this time, and his curriculum, the curriculum there was very, very, very rigorous, and they, he knew or was studied all the things that we've been studying, but in their, in their original languages. Then he got a BA at, at Christ College in Cambridge. He went on to get an MA, which just meant he read a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton. He travels to France and Italy, which, as I mentioned, is a little bit weird, especially the Italian part, because Milton is an extreme Puritan and the Catholicism in Italy is, of course, the, the home of, of Catholicism. So from here, um, he marries twice, which is important because he writes, <coughs> he writes divorce tracts. Um, let's fast forward. We see that he dies in 1674, Paradise Lost is published in 1667. Now let's go to our timeline here. So this is, um, this is significant really in Milton's life and we'll see the way in which the dates of his life interact with the dates of English history. So James, this is off the charts, James becomes king in 1603 after Elizabeth. From 1603 to 1625, he reigns. Remember, we saw King James in the poem to Pensers by Ben Jonson and Charles gets mentioned, his young son. In 1625, Charles becomes king. Now, one of the things that's distinctive about Charles is that he's married to a French woman who is Catholic. So, and that not only, he was not only influenced by his wife, but he had his own kind of predilections, his own tendencies towards not Catholicism, because remember the church in England is run by the King of England, or the, the monarch, starting with Henry VIII, but he had his tendencies or proclivities to what is called a kind of high church Anglicanism. Now the words high church and low church make a certain kind of sense. High church really just means all of the embellishments, all of the traditions, all of the rituals. And what came along with this is that Charles was taking more and more of a role in not only the political life of the nation, but the religious life of the nation. And many of the things that Elizabeth had really done away with or had moderated, Charles is now going to emphasize the centrality of the church, the centrality of ritual life. And you can see Puritans like Milton were upset that Charles was reintroducing a lot of the um, a lot of the decoration and even the furniture of the old Catholic Church. Believe it or not, there was a, a dispute during our period about what kind of table to put in a church. Is the table called an altar? Or is the table a table? It's kind of a, a, a theological version on the Platonic dispute. Now, Charles wanted to look at the table inside of the church with his, his, main, his main man, his Archbishop of Canterbury, who's this guy named Stafford. Um, <clears throat> I think I have it in my timeline here from a long time ago. Let's see that one here. Um, so Stafford, um, he introduced the, the, the altar table back into the church. And there was this idea that bringing the altar table back was kind of like bringing idolatry back into the church. You can have an altar, you can have a table, but a table that is supposed to be an altar. Well, all that is a, a way of trying to spiritualize the physical. So Puritans, radical Puritans like Milton um, really felt that was idolatrous and they rebelled against it. Um, Here's my, my, my long ago um, timeline. Here's 1625, the accession of church, uh, Charles I. 
lots of squabbles with parliament over taxation. The king wanted to have power of the purse. Um, in 1628, the parliament is kind of acting up. They want more rights. In 1629 to 1640, Charles says, enough with you. This is what some leaders would like to do today and some leaders actually do today. Um, uh, Charles rules without the parliament for 11 years. In 1633, William Laud becomes the Archbishop of Canterbury. That guy also, he was very Catholic leaning. Um, in 1637, you've got all these Puritans who are punished. It's kind of like a, a replay of, 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 of um, Fox's Book of Monuments. But now it's the English King Charles, still the English King Charles and not Mary, who is persecuting per Puritans. Basswick, Burton, Prynne sentenced to imprisonment. Um, people lost their ears as branding for publishing pamphlets which attacked the bishops. The bishops, of course, part of a church hierarchy. Um, Laud gets tried and imprisoned by, I guess, the influence of parliament. I'm not really even sure. This is before the revolution. Here's in 1642. Um, the beginning of the English Civil War. And that really is a very important date for us, the beginning of English Civil War. We found ourselves earlier with Milton's life. Um, he's, off in, he's off in France and, and Italy as things are really heating up. He gets called back and he continually during this period writes prose tracts having to do with the church against the church on behalf of divorce. Here again, more, more arguments against the church. These essays, one on education, what is the right kind of education? Aria Pagitico, which is probably his most famous tract about his, about his idea of what a Christian commonwealth will look like. Um, let's go back to our timeline here. So 1642, um, the Civil War starts. Let's just go to the key dates here. In 1648, and let's look at some pictures now. In 1648, well, this is after Charles has already been captured and he's in prison. And this is the time of Commonwealth. This is, remember when I spoke about Milton's optimism and utopianism and the work that he writes in 1644, Aria Pagitica, what's in a name, remember the Areopagus from the Aristia in Greece, the Areopagus is the Greek seat of justice. Well, Milton is updating that and he's finding England or the English Commonwealth to be the seat of justice, but it's also different because it's not just a Greek Commonwealth, it is a Christian Commonwealth. So this is the heyday for Milton. Now, Unfortunately, not everybody believed with Milton as enthusiastically in the Christian Commonwealth. And even though the Civil War starts, Charles is in jail. This figure here, this is a satirical painting. This is the figure of Cromwell. Look at the little doggies here. Here's the figure of Cromwell. Notice that he's associated with these dogs. He's chasing members of parliament out of the chamber because he wants to have a vote on whether Charles should be tried or not. And many of the members of parliament, as much as they were for a parliamentary commonwealth, did not like the idea of trying a king. You don't try a king um, easily. Remember, uh, we, we, we can think in our own reference points that the assassination of a political leader is more significant than the assassination of an individual, because by assassinating a political leader, you're really taking aim at the state. It's, a, it's an act of war against the state and not only the person. So these parliamentarians felt strongly about not trying Charles. And here we have this image of the little short man, Cromwell with his doggies, chasing the parliamentarians out of parliament so he could have a majority. Imagine uh, democratic leaders today who would love to have the same kind of option. So Cromwell is rushing these parliamentarians out of the chamber, and this becomes what will be known as the rump parliament, the rump meaning just the rump of the parliament. It's not a, not a nice name. And they together decide in the absence of these other members to try and eventually to execute Charles the first that's in 1649. This is a, a picture 
or a, a, a woodcut or rendering of the execution of Charles. Now, we can see that this is like a scaffold and Shakespeare in his drama makes puns or, or shows the relationship between the scaffold that's used inside the theater and the scaffold that's used to execute people. The scaffold was a platform. So here is the scaffold, the platform, and this is very much a production of parliament. Uh, unfortunately for them, the production kind of goes wrong, meaning they want to dramatize their power. We've spoken about the way in which Elizabeth dramatizes her power early on. And the parliament is trying to do that themselves. Now check out this image, right? Here's the image of the, the masked executioner, Charles's head. Where is Charles's head? Um, I guess, oh, there it's plopping off and the blood streaming out and everybody paying close attention. Here's the sky pointing out to the dramatic action. This is a Dutch painting, I think. Now notice in the foreground, this guy. So this guy in the foreground um, kind of gives us an indication or a sense of the descent involved in relationship to this execution. On the one hand, everybody else is looking enthralled, but this figure stands out in the foreground and perhaps is relating to us, that is, even with the sense perhaps of the justice of parliament, how can you kill a king? How can you possibly kill a king? And what happens, here's a, a picture of, the, of Charles um, um, in court, I think this is the Chief Justice Bradshaw. He was famous for the hat that he wore, which you can still see, I think, in the British Museum. Um, Charles was executed, as we said, brought to trial by Bradshaw. And one indication of the extent to which the drama of Charles's execution didn't work the way they wanted it to was that this gets published right after Charles's death. This is the frontispiece towards to a, a, a work called Icon Basilica. Icon Basilica means very literally icon, the image. Basilica is of the king. Here's the image of the king. Here's another rendering. Here's a colorized rendering. There were so many, 1648, right? That's, Charles was killed in 1649, um, but the dating was a little different back then. They like sometimes 1648, 1649 might mean a, a, the same thing. Um, so, but this is this is clearly published after his death. Charles is already killed, executed. You see, he's looking up, his eyes sighting the, the glorious crown, the crown of vanity on the ground. Um, he is pictured as a kind of King David figure, but more than that, as a kind of Christ figure, the portrait of his sacred majesty and his solitudes and suffering. It's meant to be the last days of Charles's life. And it, it may seem to us from our perspective, a, a well, just a blip on the, on the um, historical scene, but the Icon Basilica, this text, the image of the king was the most popular book published in England for two centuries. And the most popular book was the Bible. So there's a very, very strong, strong attachment to the idea of English kingship. And when in 1660, Charles's son, Charles II comes back, there really is rejoicing because there is a sense that what had been done um, needed to be undone. And just as in Shakespeare's plays, he looks back to the War of the Roses and sees the primal scene or the, the sin of Richard II, or not Richard II, of Henry uh, Bolingbroke, who steals the crown from Richard and that ends up with centuries of war between the white and the red rose between Lancaster and York. So this is kind of history being repeated and, they, and, the, and, the, and, and the culture at large really doesn't want to repeat it. Now, this became, even during the, during the, the period of 1648, 1649, an extremely popular tract that gets published and republished. Now, the parliamentarians needed somebody to come in and, and, and argue against it. And who did it? Our friend, John Milton. Now, what's, where does it say Milton's name here? The author, Johannes Milton, John Milton. And his work is not called Icon Basilica. We get the Greek here, but it is called Iconoclastes. Here is the image of the king and Milton says, you are the image of the king and I'm the breaker of that image. So Milton, we said in class, Milton was one of the list of 20 people who is designated to be, to be um, killed by, by um, Charles II. In 1660, when Charles returns, Milton is imprisoned and his works are called in and burnt. 
So when we think of Milton as a poet, it's impossible to think of Milton outside of the perspective of his involvement in the English Civil War. 1660, Milton writes another tract, the ready and easy way to establish a commonwealth. There's no ready way, there's no easy way. This is a, 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 this is a, a quotation from, from the Bible in some place. There's no ready way, there's no easy way. Um, this is really a, a tract of political despair at this point. Charles is back. From Milton's perspective, there was the high point in 1644 of Areopagitica, this idea of a free English nation, the rising, rousing English nation that was um, throwing off idolatry, the idolatry of the king, the idolatry of religion, the idolatry of the church. Milton is an independent. He doesn't like the church. He doesn't like organized worship. He wants to worship the way he wants to. But by 1660, the nation has turned against him. He writes two um, essays, two tracts called The Defense of the English People, the first and second defense. And he finds that the people that he's defending, the people on his side are becoming smaller and smaller in Paradise Lost in book seven, in one of the count them, four invocations that Milton writes, not satisfied to just write one as Homer and Virgil do, he writes four. In book seven, he calls out to the muse and he wonders to himself whether he's really up to the right thing, whether writing an epic is the right thing, because as he writes, he only has, a, he has a fit audience that is, there is a good audience, we are among them, but they are very, very few, because most of them had tur have turned back to the idolatry of kingship and the king. So Milton ends his life blind. Um, he writes Paradise Lost really by reciting it to his daughter because he's blind. She, his, she is his, his amnu, amnuensis. I write that down, amenuensis, amenuensis, which is she's the one who writes down um, Paradise Lost as, as, as he recites it to her in his blindness. So there really is very much for Milton at the end of his life, this sense of despair. So when we enter the world of Paradise Lost, Paradise Lost is the loss of Eden. Paradise Lost is the loss of English Commonwealth. Paradise Lost is Milton in his blindness. Paradise Lost is Milton ex experiencing the, the personal and political traumas of the past half century. And writing really, I think Paradise Lost, one way of thinking about it is a work of mourning. That is, how can, how can you go on? How is it possible to go on? given this, given what Milton felt was a betrayal. Now, as I mentioned to you, and now we're concluding a little longer than I thought, but oh so worthwhile, in concluding what Milton looked at as the heyday of, of or the, 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 the possibility of England as a reform nation, starting really in the 18th century, or even much earlier than that, there's a sense that whatever Milton was up to was very, very bad. It ended up in regicide, it ended up in revolution, it ended up in chaos. And in the 18th century, there really is a sense we have to clamp down on whatever Milton represents, inspiration, enthusiasm, that's a big, big word. Enthusiasm in almost its original Greek sense, to be enthused, to be inspired by God, all of this is bad and we need to, to clamp down on it. This begins to happen in 1688, 1689, when John Locke, the, the really philosopher of liberalism, starts to talk about the importance of toleration, the building of a society based not upon inspiration at all, but based upon rights and property rights, and Milton and the 17th century kind of get put neatly away, or they try to put Milton neatly away. But of course, because of the power of his voice and the power of his poetry, he keeps on exploding again and again into literary history.